Oh, good morning, Todd Adamson. Good morning. How are you? Oh, wow. That was very sedated. This is no singing today. <laughs> we are letting the vocal cords breathe after an evening of I thought I was still 20. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a celebration because you're in Charleston. I know. It's so good to be here. And we are recording in the same house. I know. It's crazy. This never happens. And so we, it this was, a, you know, happens. I think you just got a little carried away and that's okay. It was exciting. You know, listen, I went to a beautiful place called the Beer Garden in downtown <laughs> Charleston. <laughs> and they, I was a little overserved. <laughs> Okay. Well, we don't make a habit of that. Let's. I'll cut this out. I'm teasing. Yeah, yeah. I'm teasing. No, I didn't handle it so well. We had no idea. I know. No, (laughs) I really. I had a great time last night, and yeah, I just love Charleston so much. For those of you listening, you must come to Charleston, South Carolina. It is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Maybe I'm biased because we both grew up here, but (laughs) yeah, I know. But we objectively looking out over the water right now, it is. It's, it's beautiful it's despite the gloomy weather. So, you know, hopefully things clear up a little bit because Easter is tomorrow and, you know, all the exciting stuff that comes with that. But, you know, it's just an exciting time having you here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So what have you been up to? Well, you know, mostly just churning out these podcasts. You know, we just we're on a roll. Right now, and yeah, just we are. still continue to be in awe of all the amazing people that we have been talking to. But, you know, obviously, I have lots of other responsibilities. So, been preparing for Easter and did a little Easter egg hunt with Isabel at her school. She is like a foot taller than all of the other kids in her class. So, you couldn't miss her. But it was just, it was really cute because they could only get 12 eggs, like max, so that everybody could get some. And she got those eggs so fast. And then she went around and helped everybody else find their eggs. And it was just Aww. like, it just, you know, melted my heart. So I'm just, you know, in a feel good place right now and excited for, you know, just we, all the. We love to see it. We love to hear it. Yes, this is just a place of love and happiness. Speaking of which, (laughs) we have an awesome guest today who is making great change and just killing it out there and fighting for the rights of lots of people that deserve it. And it's just an awesome inspiration. So I want to thank you, first of all, for introducing me to your friend, Jonathan, who we have on here. And I think that everybody's going to really love our talk. So could you let everybody know a little bit about our guest? Absolutely. So Jonathan Lovitz is a nationally recognized economic public policy and communications leader and the director of public affairs and senior advisor for the Economic Development Administration in the U.S. Department of Commerce. He comes to the EDA after a decade of service at the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, NGLCC, and National Business Inclusion Consortium, NBIC. There he helped write, advocate for, and pass the more than 25 federal, state, and city laws and policies opening up billions of dollars in economic opportunity to minority small business owners, veterans, those with disabilities, and LGBTQ-owned businesses. He has led advocacy initiatives across America on voting rights, non-discrimination, health care, access, gun safety, and more. Lovitz has served as a regular guest on MSNBC, CNBC, NPR, and Bloomberg TV, among others, and as a keynote speaker for organizations including the U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Treasury, the United Nations, and the Human Rights Campaign. Prior to advocacy, Lovitz was a performer in multiple national tours of Broadway shows, regional theaters, and television shows. Without further ado, we give you Jonathan Lovitz. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning. Good morning. We're so excited to have you on. Thank you for joining us. I'm thrilled to be here. You guys have a really important podcast. I have heard such great stories on it, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. Yay. Well, Jonathan, we know you are no stranger to the spotlight, but could you give us, our listeners, a little background about yourself, uh, where you grew up, and sort of your life before performing and politics? 
Sure. So uh, my name is Jonathan Lovitz. My pronouns are he, him, and I am now based in Washington, D.C., but the story began in South Florida, where I was a huge nerd, and one of the many huge nerd outlets that I fell into was uh, the theater and was a, a young kid performer where I first discovered that love of the spotlight and using my voice for something. I wasn't sure where that was going to take me yet, but through theater and debate and all kinds of uh, community service projects. I really liked being out in front of people. So continued to study that through high school and college, went to the University of Florida, go Gators. And from there, after studying a combination of arts and political science things, my life took a wild right turn, I, I guess we'll talk about, but it was an incredible journey that took me right into the heart of the performing world. Awesome. Well, we are so happy to talk about all of those things. You have a very, I think, it was quite the journey, it seems, with with everything you've been through. <laughs> but I think it's important to note that on February 13th of 2023, Joe Biden appointed you as Director of Public Affairs and Senior Advisor at the U.S. Economic Development Administration and the U.S. Department of Commerce. Can you kind of break down for our listeners what exactly it is that you do in layman's terms and what is the you best mean that part? wasn't perfectly clear for my long government <laughs> title? Um, I mean, we so get I, it. We just want everybody yeah. else to get it, you know? And no, what's for the best? Sure. <laughs> yeah. To put it simply, I am the luckiest man and the most grateful man that my job is to go to work on behalf of the president and the vice president and the secretary of commerce to do nothing but deliver good news. The EDA where I work gives out millions, if not billions of dollars in grants to help communities and to help recover from disasters and to build programs that create jobs and do just so much good in all corners of America. And I get to tell their story and connect great people to it and be part of the policymaking that that helps a lot of people recover and grow. And it is you know, especially as someone who was a huge West Wing fan and who has loved politics my whole life, to be given the honor of being asked to serve in this way and at such a senior level is so truly incredible. And I work with the most passionate and dedicated people um, in the Commerce Department, across the administration. Everyone deeply cares about helping. And it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. I say every day that I have never been happier to be so exhausted. And I will stick around doing this as long as they'll have me. What's the best part of the new job? There's so many, but it is, for me, especially as someone who's a policy and process and like government junkie, you know, the kind of person who like watches C-SPAN for fun, I walk into the building every day and I tap my key card and I get into an elevator with you know, the blue Department of Commerce carpet with the seal behind me in the elevator. And I just think, this is real. This is really happening to me. And I'm a part of something very, very special. And I don't take any of it for granted. And then, you know, the world that I'm afforded to chance to be a part of, I was at the White House last weekend for the garden tour. And it was a whole bunch of other appointees and folks from the administration. We all just kind of bonded over the fact that we, we can't believe we're living this truly incredible dream. And the honor to be a part of it is, is just amazing. It must be, you must be like pinching yourself every day. I am. The work is hard. The opposition is hard. The sentiment out there can be difficult, but the work is great. The work is thrilling and I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And I think that's all any of us can want to be a part of. Before getting into all of this, we kind of alluded to this, but you started your career as a performer and toured on Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat <laughs> and Jesus Christ Superstar among you know, just a few of the things you did, but some might argue that politics isn't all that different from performance. But why did you decide to pivot away from Broadway and performing? It pivoted me. And this is why, especially now, I return to my college and have been a part of a lot of college lectures and masterclasses with young artists and, and young leaders. And I tell them, the one thing you can count on in life is that the plan you put on a piece of paper with your folks is not going to be the, the master plan in the end. Try as you might, it will not be that straight line. And the best thing you can do is learn everything, be open to everything, pull your sail as wide and as tight as you can so it can catch all the wind whenever it comes, and then steer yourself accordingly. So that's what happened to me. I performed for years and years and years, and in, in that honed 
literally my voice, but also how I wanted to use it when I wasn't performing. And in New York at the time, got heavily involved in political causes, but also a lot of LGBTQ youth and HIV awareness causes and things where I could use all of those skills to win people over for two hours on a stage, to win them over for you know an hour in a meeting room, getting them to rise up for a cause. So it is very much the same thing. And I say that often that, that every young performer should take a psychology and a political science class to understand the motivations of why people do what they do. It will make you a better performer and will also help you understand how to market yourself and know your place and your value in the market, which is you know, you are a part of a market when you're a performer. And conversely, I think every business person, every political person, every muggle out there should use an arts class to their advantage, to learn humanity, to learn the importance of empathy and interactivity and reading a room. The most successful communications directors and press secretaries and even politicians that I know and work with all had an arts background because you can walk into any room and pivot your monologue accordingly and win the room over based on the energy that's going on in there. And where else are you going to learn that more acutely than performing? So I am so well served by that incredible period of my life. And one of the coolest things from it, one of the most inspiring things that happened from it was a lot of actors that I knew from performing through that time in my life are now involved in my life in such a different way on things like, you know, I ran for office and I had several, you know, folks like Billy Porter do a campaign video for me. And, you know, Audra retweeted me. And I think if 15 year old me knew that Audra McDonald was going to retweet my campaign donation link, my God. <laughs> and so, you know, and I get to work with some of these folks on campaigns. I mean, I brought in, the cast of the West Wing to do a PSA on voting. And so it's really incredible that you can keep the passion for what you do very much alive and apply it into anything else that you do in your life, if you choose to. It's incredible, Jonathan. And, you know, listen, we talk a lot on this show about overcoming trauma and hardships. And obviously, as you know, the LGBTQIA plus community, you know, goes through that on the daily. But you came out when you were 16, correct? I did. And how did your family and peers handle the news? You know, I am perpetually reminding myself, my husband, others, that I came from such a lucky situation because I grew up in South Florida where being out was nothing new. We were surrounded by great examples. You know, when we grew up, uh, we had a summer house in New Jersey where we'd go into New York City often. And I was never unaware of diversity around me. I didn't necessarily know what it was or how to sort of maybe how to recognize it, but I knew it was there. You know, I, I am a firm believer in my work today and the, the maxim that you can't be what you can't see. And I saw a lot of what I wanted to be when I was very young. I had older, you know, gay mentors when I was in the theater. I had folks in the art world that I really looked up to and, you know, did things for me on a totally tacit level that, you know, I didn't know that it was helping me feel good about who I would eventually become when I was much younger. But it did simply because it was a non-issue. So spinning that forward, you know, many years later, I'm so active with youth causes because I know what an unusual journey I had, that the boyfriend I took to prom was not my first high school boyfriend and how totally benign and accepted that was and how heartbreaking it is to see Florida, where I grew up, take that big step backwards in terms of protecting kids. Yeah, I think it is like, you know, even if somebody that's not in that community, it is like just so yeah. depressing to almost see this like regression. It's, and I know how, you know, politics, it's always a, a pendulum. There's like backlash from progress and and all that, but it's just, it gets to you. Like, I think it's like a little bit, it gets to me to a point where, you know, even as a woman and, you know, having our rights feel like they're going backwards as well. I can't even imagine when you feel like you're finally making strides, then to have that just kind of like nixed, like, right? Beneath, I mean, yeah. I can't imagine. It's heartbreaking. It's devastating. It's also in many ways inspiring because, I mean, look at the young people around this country who are refusing to accept this right. because they grew up in a world where who they were was not questioned until they were old enough to vote. And that's not going to go well for folks. So 
one of the things, you know, I'm very lucky. I spent so much of my recent career in advocacy working at that intersection of business and, and minority communities and finding the ties that bind, especially in recent years, have gotten tighter than they've ever been. Because I think there's a recognition that if they're coming for my community on a Monday, they're coming for yours on a Wednesday. So better we link arms and march down that street together as an impenetrable force. You know, and especially for LGBTQ people, there's been such a remarkable, I think, recognition that we are all communities. You know, queer people are women, we are people of color, we are veterans, we are immigrants, we have disabilities, we are high and low income, we stra- you know, we straddle every community. So there's no such thing as a fight out there that isn't somewhat also a queer and gender justice fight as well. So as we are expecting allyship and support from our friends, it is imperative on us we return the favor and march and you know and and you know not just march, fundraise and fight and lobby and advocate on behalf of women, of people of color, of unhoused and the formerly incarcerated, and all kinds of communities that are just being told you are less than, and that's just not how we work here. Yeah, I think that was very evident when you know the Supreme Court kind of struck down Roe v. Wade. It was like an immediate and an appropriate reaction that, you know, basically the LGBTQ community was like, you know, the repercussions of that are then connected to gay marriage and all these other rights to to other things. So it was sad, but also beautiful to kind of see everybody rally together around that. And hopefully we can basically rewind that and get back to a place where we all feel safe and that this kind of older generation that I think in a way is trying to like cling and before they go, you know, like, like, well, I'm going to make sure I do whatever I can before I die to try to suppress this. But there's really not that much hope, I think, for this, for that, because there, like you said, there is this whole generation that has, has grown up with feeling comfortable in their own skin and and speaking out about things like that. So and being purpose driven. I mean, it's there's the double edged sword. And I think about this now as someone who hires a lot of young people for their first and, and early jobs in their careers, that, you know, there's that sort of aggressive take against new young workers that, oh, they are lazy or they won't be as committed to companies or they want to just be here for a couple of years and move on. Great. Make those the most impactful couple of years that you have them. Give them a purpose. Give them good work to do, and they will stay as long as you can. You know, you can possibly keep them. And I think we're seeing a lot of that in the various movements, which is young people want to be involved in something that is bigger than them, that outlasts them. And driving it back to you know, performing artists, we saw it. Throughout the pandemic, we saw it now in folks raising money, doing voter drives, doing whatever it can they can in conjunction with their art, because that's their vehicle. That's their protest. That's their mechanism. And I think that's awesome. It's something that I've loved about my work and my career is I've realized there's a great, I'm paraphrasing a great sort of Jewish mantra and maxim that is, no one is expecting you to complete the work, but you're not allowed to absolve yourself of starting. So everyone is involved. Everyone has skin in the game. You know, whether, and and I say this when I do a lot of talks in corporations and things about particularly LGBTQ involvement, I said, look, whether you're at the back of the parade, just being there in support or the guy up front doing high kicks, all that matters is that you're at the parade. (laughs) Figuratively, Figuratively and literally just be there, be in solidarity and be in service. And, you know, look, Actors' Equity is about to go on strike and demand rightfully what a lot of artists deserve, especially on the road. And I still am a dues paying union member because I believe in paying that forward to people. I got my help throughout the union for years and years and years in my career. And so I keep paying it forward while I'm able. And I would, you know, time permits, I'd love to go stand and join the picket lines and and let people know that you're seeing people at this touring house who can't afford a hotel in the city they're playing in and are sleeping in their cars out back. Think about that when you buy your ticket. Mm Mm-hmm. That is what's going on right now. We're headed towards a strike. I mean, Equity just just said that we're going to, for touring shows, that they're going to strike. Shit's getting real. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that speaking of kind of striking, in 2011, you refused to serve on a New York City jury, citing the lack of equal protections and marriage equality for LGBT citizens. 
And that led to multiple appearances on MSNBC and NPR. You just kind of blew up there. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience and whether you suffered any kind of anxiety or backlash from the refusal to participate in that jury? Yes, that was a wild time to think it was, my gosh, 20 years ago already that New York City had not yet passed marriage equality in the state. And so I was being asked to serve on a simple jury in the city, a fairly benign case. But the judge does what they do during voir dire and asks, is there anyone here who cannot be impartial? And I was pretty adamant that they kept laying on the shtick about a jury of your peers. And I said, well, unfortunately, my peers here have different rights than I do. So we're not quite peers. And I wasn't, you know, I I assumed I was still going to get picked anyway. I wasn't trying to make a case, but I just said, this is my belief, take it or leave it. And somebody else in that room had tweeted it out. And next thing I know, this thing had just blown up. And it was such an interesting time in my life because I had begun sort of the tiptoe from theater to television to at that point I was doing some news anchoring and some sort of where I say I was learning that my favorite role was me with a microphone because <laughs> I can be a heightened version of me, but I can get good answers out of people having a conversation like this. So the fact that I was starting to be recognized from some TV work and some public speaking things, like it all just very quickly snowballed. And that's how really the big transition in my careers began that I went from performing full time to performing part time to these organizations, the Human Rights Campaign, the ACLU, different groups saying like, hey, you're young, you clearly get fired up about stuff. We'd like to send you to get kids fired up at colleges and maybe go to some corporate boardrooms and just have you use your voice to do something. And I was all about it. And I thought it'd be a couple of weeks you know, a few months contract turned into or a month contract turned into a few months contract before I knew what I was doing this full time. And then I started looking into organizations that I could join and be part of their movement in house. And that's how sort of the, the official transition from artist to advocate happened. And I went in house to a couple of great organizations. And that's how we got to where I am today. But it really did begin with just not keeping my mouth shut on something I cared about. I remember that, Jonathan. I remember all of a sudden, you know, back in those days, it went viral. So it was like, it was a different kind of viral than it is now. But I, I like that you say that, like we got a whole bunch of telegraph messages. It was, yeah. 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was that? It was, was a long time ago. A guy from Western Union kicked the door down with the telegram and said, you're never going to believe no, this. No, but what I'm saying is that it was for 2011. It was a huge, huge deal. Like you said, I mean, we, we weren't even, we still weren't even able, even able to get married. So like, it was a while ago, but I do feel that I just remember all of a sudden you were on every friggin' news program. And I would just remember turning on the TV because I was doing, you know, still doing ships at the time. And I remember being in the middle of the ocean and going into my room and turning on MSNBC and you're, and Jonathan is sitting there talking about this crazy thing, that this amazing thing that he did. And because I knew you as an actor. So like, you know, and a friend, but I was so, I don't know if I've ever told you, but you know, you really, really made a huge mark with that statement. You really did move the post. And listen, you were named by Business Equality Magazine's 40 LGBTQ leaders under 40, and the Advocate Magazine named you as one of their 2019 queer icons. How does it feel, Jonathan, to receive these honors and be such a public spokesperson for the community? I mean, they mean the world, but as, uh, I can't remember if it was Patty Lapone or somebody was once said in their memoir, you know, the Tony's great, but don't forget the bottom's just plastic. And, <laughs> and I remind myself of that sometimes that yes, the awards are incredible. They mean a lot, especially when, you know, you can go to an event and raise some visibility for an organization, but no one accomplishes anything on their own. And the recognitions are because of a lifetime of work and commitment as part of something bigger. And the one thing I hope those recognitions do and sort of the world around them that I'm trying to build and be a part of is that it creates more interest in more people doing more work. I say this a lot when I do, especially when I was working on passing laws, when I was working as a lobbyist for the Chamber of Commerce was I talked to a lot of people about how we're going to shatter some barriers and crack some glass ceilings and There are going to be a lot of people in this room that we're speaking to that are going to be the first at what they do. While that's incredible, the most important thing is that none of us are the last. So if the awards, if any awards, and I say this to anyone listening, if if any award, if any accolade, if any even just 
self-congratulation makes you feel good, remember the only thing that feels better is dropping down the ladder and pulling someone else up with you and, and sharing that along. Being a sponsor for someone, being a mentor, being a champion for a friend, a colleague, that is, that's one of my favorite things about this work now. And getting to see people figure out who they want to be. And even a lot of artists that I knew during the pandemic reached out and said, I'm not working now. And you know what? I kind of like how my body feels and what sleep is like and what, you know, maybe saving a little money looks like. So talk to me about a pivot. And I said, look, you're not giving up on anything. Your dreams are your dreams. You can just find different ways to express them and use those skills to do exactly what you want. Do you think when I'm in front of a crowd delivering a speech to 2,000 people, that's it's just a musical at a podium. That's all that is. It's the same skill set. <laughs> and I'm good to, at, at doing one because I was good at doing the other. So find ways to do it, to apply what you do. Yeah. I think that's like a, a an important skill for everyone. And I think it's like less suffocating when you think about it that way. Like, you know, you can take things that you've learned. I mean, Todd knows this. I have like a million jobs and, but they all in their own way are connected. You know, it's, I'm, I'm kind of doing the same communicating, managing all of that in, in all the different forms that I do. And I get to live my passion out in different ways. And so I'm never bored right. and I have different platforms for all of this. And that's incredibly satisfying. So, you know, I love that concept too, of that, you know, they say like, you know, if you've been through hell or you've escaped the fire, then be the person that comes back and brings water for the others. So that's right. I love that. And you are, you know, such a great spokesperson within politics and with everything else that you do. So we kind of want to know what your take on this drag queen ban in Tennessee is and other similar policies that are kind of seemingly sweeping the nation right now. Well, you really said it earlier, Laura, it's a dying gasp of a quote unquote sense of traditionalism that doesn't exist for much longer in this country. And it is very easy to fear what you don't understand and convert that fear and, you know, it is into anger. It is very easy. And I think it's the easy and cheap way out to lean into fear versus inspire through joy and positivity and acceptance and tolerance and all of those things. And it is so much easier to whip up fury and passion with anger than it is with joy. So that's what's happening is when you find boogeymen and women and you heap all of your fears and anxieties about the world changing on them as your scapegoats, all you're trying to do is scare people. You're not making a point about any kind of issue. So I think there are, you know, we should take heart in some of the incredible work that's being done by the ACLU and Lambda Legal and all of these organizations that please Google and check out how you can support and donate and, and get behind. Because, you know, what's particularly tough about this moment we're in, whether it's the drag ban or a book ban or contraception or you name the, the issue, it's all about control. And these organizations that fight back to preserve your rights and liberties to make your own choices in any context are fighting many battles on many fronts. And that takes a lot of money and a lot of resources. So if you benefit in any way, if you love someone who benefits in any way from being free, and I think that's all of us, you have to be involved. Period. It's like a non-negotiable it is a non-negotiable. It is, you know, with the great quote, and I apologize that I can't remember who said it now, but service is the price we pay for living on earth. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something we need to lean into more right now is being right. of service to one another. Because if not you who, stop waiting for your neighbor to do the thing that you know you can do. And again, do it at scale. Not everyone needs to change the world for everyone, but change your corner of it. And you've done something wonderful. So- Correct. And speaking more into that, Jonathan, I remember years ago, there was an attack on our community during the, the Trump administration. And I texted you and I said, Jonathan, what do we do? And I don't know if you remember this, but you wrote back a very short sentence and you, you wrote, now we fight. And do you feel like the trauma 
anguish and sort of danger that the LGBTQIA plus community goes through, even in today's more, you know, quote unquote, accepting culture is still going to be a fight for years to come? (laughs) Well, to, you know, contextualize this conversation, we're recording this on Passover weekend. So there's a lot of people thinking right now about how the fight never ends. You know, ostensibly, several thousand years ago, my people were supposed to be free and live in the good life. And Jews are still working through some things. So the fight is never done. And I think that that's one of the great things about progress. It is a perpetually moving goalpost. You know, remember, we were on the moon four years before a woman could get a credit card without a husband. Think about that. Progress is always moving. So we will never be done because there will always be more to the fight. And it's, I also think it's one of the important things about this moment. We're hearing a lot of buzzwords about things like equality and equity and not necessarily understanding the context for either. Equality is that everyone has access to the same thing equally and evenly all the time. On paper, the law says LGBTQ people can't be fired from their jobs because of the Bostock decision of the Supreme Court because we're protected by the same provisions as gender in the workplace. If you are fired in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in San Francisco, you can go to a million places to get free legal support, to go to your corporate HR, to go to a zillion different places to get the help you need. Do you think the first-generation immigrant trans-Latina in deep South Texas has the same access to services and support when she gets fired? That's where equity comes into play, because just because the rights on paper doesn't mean it is achievable by everybody. And so we can write all the laws to make us equal and even and free, but we've got to fix the processes that keep us from achieving that. And we have to do it quickly. Yeah. And on more of a national scale, as opposed to, I mean, I understand states rights, blah, blah, blah. Sure. But it is incredibly frustrating when, you know, you you can be almost in a, like these neighboring states and all these people have rights in this place. And then you just go like a few miles this way. And now we're in a totally different world. And Equality is dictated by zip code mm-hmm. in far too many issues around the country. And it's not supposed to be that way, but we're working on it. Yeah. And I think a big part of that is people like you. Who, you know, in 2015, you joined the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce as the VP of External Affairs and Director of NGLCC. So as the head of their advocacy division, you led the efforts to write, lobby for, and implement policies for the inclusion of certified LGBT business enterprises in the public sector. Can you explain to us what all of that really entailed and why these were such important policy changes? Well, thank you. And kudos to you both on the rock solid homework. Uh, (laughs) We like to do that, you know? (laughs) Well, this is awesome. So, you know, most folks know a chamber of commerce. Most folks know the strength and power of business in their community to create jobs, to create community, to strengthen neighborhoods. And I was given this opportunity to work at the organization that represents about one and a half million LGBT owned businesses in the United States. And then as well as its interests for that community around the world. And I fell in love with that years ago, as we were talking about sort of on that journey to finding what I wanted to do next, speaking at one of their galas where I saw all of these Fortune 500, 100, Fortune 50 companies literally throwing their weight around to say, one of the ways we can impact equality is through business, through economics. As I, and I really was inspired by that because I thought about marriage equality, for example, and how It was the business community demanding that this be an imperative that is good for business and good for people that helped drive hundreds and hundreds of corporations to sign amicus briefs in support of the court and then come back around a decade later and support the Equality Act and all of these things because it's good for their people. Because to your point, Laura, like you shouldn't have to decide, do I work at the, you know, Birmingham, Alabama office or the New York City office if I want to just live my life? And I shouldn't have to decide the zip code. The zip code shouldn't be dictating my future, especially not when economics is so universal. So I really fell in love with that concept and got to work on these issues where in most cities and states, there are special goals 
in contracting, in things like construction programs that are to help women-owned, Black-owned, Hispanic-owned companies get to the table. Because, and I'm sure this will shock no one, the golfing buddy of the chief procurement officer tends to do really well in the contract negotiations. So to help level that playing field, there are these certifications and these special programs that help small businesses not get a handout, but just get a leg up in the room so that people can see them evenly alongside all of these historic and legacy businesses. And we went door to door, literally, to mayors and governor's mansions and state legislatures across the country saying, corporate America says that equality in business includes more than race and gender. It includes LGBT people and people with disabilities and veterans and all of these other quote unquote minority categories. We're going to help you implement policies to put them into your contracting. And what did it do? Declaring places open for business attracted the kinds of not just innovations and great new startups and small businesses that created jobs, but also brought in that sense of equal and inclusive society that made people want to pick up and move there and start a business there and grow a family there. So declaring yourself open for business with everyone is leaning into that frame that equality benefits everybody. And as I was working on that legislation, one of my favorite lines that I would use in legislatures all over was red or blue, everybody sees green. There is no partisanship to helping people succeed. And it worked. When I first joined the chamber, there were two locations that recognized LGBT alongside other minority communities in business. And by the time I left, it was 32. So... But the work continues, you know, and that's one of the other important things I was always saying earlier is I left the infrastructure behind so more people could carry on that work because we are never done. Do you personally take this home with you? I mean, yes, because I look at my hairline and wonder, (laughs) wonder where all the, where it all went. Does it deeply affect you when there are losses? Yeah, it does. I care deeply about this work, but I've also over the years struggled quite a bit and you know been very vocal about it that that the anxieties the depressions that come with taking that fight on that feeling like you are atlas and the world is on your shoulders can be really tough and i am the kind of person that especially when i manage staff and friends and community members i try to absorb their pain so that they can go on working and i'll take it with me and it has gotten easier over the years to then you know diffuse that and let it back out and not let it weigh me down. But it was a struggle. It really was for a long, long time. Thank God for health insurance that provided uh, mental health resources because I was able to get through this work because of it. And I'm a champion for it and its its accessibility to people because I have learned over the years about whether you call it self-care or just, you know, management of your own heart, that is critical to being of service to others. I am adamant with people I work with, with friends in the fight, to remember that you cannot fill the cup of a thirsty friend if yours is empty. I think that's so beautiful, Jonathan. Yeah. And I just can't imagine having to see, like, you know, being a spokesperson for all this, you know, that people do turn to you to like, look back at them and see that the pain that they're going through and that, but in a way that's also, I mean, it's got to be motivating to to keep going. I mean, the kids are going to save us. I go to these events and I see not just the new fired up, you know, college kids who are raring to go, but the teenagers, the actual children who won't take it and who know that they're inheriting all of this. So I am deeply inspired. I'm also deeply inspired by the trailblazers who are still with us and still in the fight. That is another thing, you know, I mentioned that, that so many Broadway and TV pals and all have become friends in the fight, but so have the leaders. I am floored by that, that some of these people who I used would read about in books or see on TV are now friends. The person who officiated my marriage was Jim Obergefell, the man for whom the Supreme court marriage decision is named. And to be friends with that man and have him be like family is really very special. And the world of people that he knows that he's connected me with 
who I've been able to fight alongside has been just unbelievable. And do you guys like, you know, I mean, I'm assuming, and, and this may be, I sound a little ignorant even asking this question, but, you know, do you feel like that it's a safe space for you guys to all kind of talk about how hard this is on you in a personal level and not just to speak out about it, but you can lean on each other about these things? It's a beautiful question. And it is a beautiful thing that you can do for others is to be that safe space and that venting chamber that whatever it is that you need to be for each other, that that human gravity blanket, however you need to be that for other people. You know, when I was early in my service work in New York, I had no experience being the CEO of a nonprofit and I got thrown in the deep end and learned how to do it on the fly. And I succeeded because I was part of a, you know, sort of regular coffee check in and text chain with other nonprofit CEOs in New York who were all like, we get it. We get it. We can talk to each other in ways that you really can't to others who either have not lived it or, you know, who've gone through that, have not gone through that experience. One of my favorite books, it's behind me on the shelf here, is uh, The President's Club. And it's all about how American presidents stay in touch because nobody can understand what that's like except for the 46 men and future women who have sat in that office. And so that has always sort of guided me as something to do for others. And because I know what it did for me to hold that space for people who need it and to just check in with others doing what you do. And I saw that a lot, especially with artists, people that took care of each other when they were working, when they weren't working, especially, and were each other's, you know, sewing circles and therapy groups and whatever it was that they needed, just because you can lose the humanity sometimes in the rat race. Right. You know, Jonathan, you mentioned earlier, we are in Passover weekend and um, you are yourself, obviously a proud gay man, but you're also Jewish and the anti-Semitic rhetoric. Thanks for in, having me, Todd. You're right. I hate you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> listen, the anti-Semitic rhetoric in Washington right now, no. Marjorie Taylor Greene is rampant, but can you speak a bit more about how LGBT Jewish people have been targeted throughout history and does it continue today? Yeah, sure. You really can broaden out from that and just think about people who uh, people who are multiple people. You know, we hear about intersectionality as this buzzword, but mm -hmm. what does it mean? It means that all of me matters. And this was something that I dealt with a lot when I ran for office and people tried to pigeonhole me as a gay candidate or a Jewish candidate or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the like white executive candidate or all these. I was like, each one of those pieces is part of my trivial pursuit wheel. <laughs> you know, each one of those little colored pieces make me who I am. You don't get to decide what of them I am at any given time. I do. And so the ongoing anti-Semitism, which stems from quite a few sources, is a reminder that Jewish people are omnipresent. We are everywhere. We aren't going anywhere. And like any other community out there, we will only succeed in protecting ourselves and others through solidarity. Because again, if they're coming for any one of my communities today, they're coming for you tomorrow. So you cannot be removed from that fight. And one of the things I used to say all the time when I was running, and I say it a lot now in advocacy, is it doesn't have to happen to you for you to give a damn. I don't need a uterus to know that if I did, I would want it to be my mine. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I don't need kids to know that I would want them to go to a safe school and not drink out of lead pipes. So just because the fight isn't your fight doesn't mean it's not a fight worth contributing to. In fact, it's almost always the reason to be involved is because the people in that fight are exhausted. And you know, I was a Planned Parenthood escort for years. And one of my favorite things about that was seeing the amount of men who started volunteering when they saw other men volunteering. And one of the reasons we would get asked, like, why are you out here in your little vest getting screamed at by conservatives, helping women into this clinic? I said, because the women have to do enough by existing. The women have to put up with this crap when they're coming here just to get, you know, a blood test. So yes, the least we can do as men is put on the vest and be their shield. Oh, preach. I am all about that. I mean, I think it's just really sad that there are any people that can't 
see that, but at the same time, you have to think that does require empathy. <laughs> it requires you to think outside of yourself as an individual. And it's like, you know, America has really embraced this individualism, like hardcore, like my rights matter, I'm important, like, because they see everybody else, if they get more rights, well, then there's, like, my mom always says, like, this is not a pie. If you get, you know, give somebody else some rights, like, it doesn't take any from you. Like, everybody can have the rights. Like, it's not like we're going to rip away the, you know, cis white male rights just so that we can feel human as well. And I don't know where that, like, how that is serving them, you know, like how that is serving their causes, how that's helping themselves even, because at the end of the day, now you've just made a ton of enemies and you're just look at a certain point, like a lunatic, you know, like you're just holding on to these kind of antiquated ideas. But, you know, it's incredibly inspiring for me as well, that this younger generation is kind of they're done with that crap. They're just like, this is, that makes no sense. This is not what we're here for. And I think they're embracing this community aspect. And I don't really understand how people have forgotten that you can't exist on your own, you know, that you do require other people to work at a grocery store to get your groceries. Like, unless you're living in a farm in the middle of nowhere and eating only your own food, you rely on others. Yeah. So it still baffles me that there's this me first attitude that's really come out, especially this day and age. Well, you used one of my favorite metaphors that we would use all the time in the advocacy work, particularly around the contracting laws, was the pie one. Because I would have to remind, because there's a scarcity mindset out there that, well, if we help more people get access to my pie, I eat less. Mm -hmm. Let's bake more pie. You know, let us create more opportunity for people and yeah. then everyone gets even more. And also one of the things I love to remind people, you know, especially when they start calling you socialist because you want to spread some money around helping helping people succeed, the pie doesn't bake itself. You know, that pie of opportunity that you want to benefit from or have always benefited from wasn't baked by you. It was baked by everybody contributing, whether through tax dollars or hard work or however it was that they contributed to the system. We all baked that pie. So, you know, you're either going to go hungry or you keep contributing to the community pot and bake it together. Yeah. And I think it really goes to, I mean, a lot of big thing that, you know, we like to kind of push on, even with our podcast in general, with trauma, like, you know, you, you heal in community. You know, you can't, yeah. uh, nobody is healing in isolation. Yes. You know, obviously you have to do work on yourself, but it requires outside wisdom and a mirror in some ways and for somebody else to hold that mirror up too. And so, you know, if that's what we require to heal individually, like think about as a community, how much we really need to interlock and actually, you know, work together. So I think that is like, if we can give any message out to everybody out there that, you know, whether it's yourself and your own mental health or it's the nation and the, our future as a whole is we all have to work together because. Well, <laughs> Amen. And I, I love that you're, you know, you drive it back to trauma and healing because the care for yourself becomes a microcosm and a model for others to do the same. Even if it's to, follow a different path, you showing them that prioritizing your health, your well-being, your recovery from trauma is what made you stronger will show others that it's a priority, that that's how they are going to be able to do the work. And, you know, I love one of the great metaphors and memes that I keep seeing out there is you're not broken. You're a disco ball. A disco ball is just a whole bunch of broken pieces that came together to make something fabulous. And I feel like that's community, right? Like we are all our own little broken pieces that come together and fit nicely with each other to make something shiny and beautiful. And if a piece falls off, it's incumbent upon all of us to get some glue and stick it back on and say, shine, baby, shine. I love that. <laughs> and I mean, I guess kind of speaking of something beautiful, I would love to hear, um, and I'm sure that our listeners would as well, that so you are married to an on-air television weatherman, Stephen Sosna? 
Yes. And Sasna. Sasna. Yep. I apologize. But oh, you're fine. what is it like kind of both, you know, being in the spotlight and do y'all ever struggle, you know, with that, both having kind of out there in the spotlight jobs? It takes two. I thought one was enough. It's not true. No, it really does. It takes both of you being on the same page all the time. It takes, well, for one, we have a total understanding of each other's jobs. And I think it's not, you know, similar to why a lot of people in similar fields end up together for better or worse. You know, two actors find each other because they're like, well, we're the only people who are going to understand each other's schedules. So let's just do this. As opposed to thinking about, you know, will this actually work and are we going to be compatible? We are very lucky that we are and also have a complete understanding. You know, not many couples both have go bags in the hallway where, you know, there's a suit and shoes and ties and all that one each packed for both of us in a bag in the hallway so that when one gets the phone call, babe, oh my God, they need me to chase a tornado or babe, they're sending me on a plane to go fight this bill. Can you grab my go bag and throw my toothbrush in and I'll be home in a 10 minutes to pick it up and get to the airport. Like having that support system is incredible. It also means having someone that uh, can be just as exhausted in their own way as you are and understands if we're just going to sit here in silence and watch TV, that is quality time because we, but that's what we both need right now is to be alone together. And quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even look at me, but know that I love you. I'm just um, sitting here in my spot. That's marriage. You stay there. So, um, yeah. And if you have to walk by me, breathe quietly. Yeah. <laughs> it's really very special. And it's something that I think is, I didn't realize how much I needed and valued until I had it, that it, you know, you want to find someone who is your, your, your match and your energy and your equal, but also understands, you know, We've all got pain. There's, we each have our own trauma. We each have our own things we're working through. So let's work through it together in our own ways. And yeah, to be with someone else who is public and sort of out there with their work, but also as deeply dedicated and passionate about his work. I mean, the way he loves, the way he lights up, talking about climate change and fighting you know, the scourge of, of anti-environmentalism that's out there and helping young people love science. I just see the fire in him. And that's all, you know, it's why I always love people like Todd in my life that just were driven by the ambition to do something great, whatever it was, it would never be half-assed. It would be with their whole heart. And that's, that's all I care about is to be surrounded by that kind of energy. I didn't know you had the go bags. That's, I think that anyone and everyone should have a go bag for like life, like in case you want to go on a trip or whatever. That's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, sometimes you just want to say, screw it. I'm going to the airport and finding the first flight to wherever I can go. (laughs) I can't take it anymore. This is kind of a random pivot question. If you were doing an on-camera interview, like on MSNBC or something, and have you ever been in a situation where someone that is maybe on the opposition and they maybe rudely or blatantly disagree with you on your position, how hard is it to, basically, how do you handle backlash? I have heard others on the most excellent Next Page podcast talk about how when they are recipients of that kind of attack, it's almost always somebody else's drama being projected. So I can only take it so personally because I know for you to be that worked up and that offended and to find that much hate or vitriol for people just existing that comes from something deep down in you, Boo Boo, that has nothing to do with me. So I have to remember that. And I continue to remember that beyond the political work, the policy work, you know, just in human interactions, that almost always somebody's attitude towards you is a reflection of the 23 and a half hours that just happened to them in their life that didn't have you in it. So remember that and zoom out for a second. And there's also, you know, let's be real. There's just some people who exist to be angry and miserable in this world. And that's okay. You know, it's just imperative that the rest of us lean into the opposite and perpetually put our Care Bear stare out there and, you know, put a little extra light out. (laughs) We love a Care Bear moment. (laughs) I love that. The Care Bear stare for sure. I mean, I think it's, 
And it's almost too, it seems like there's just so many people out there that it they're almost like toddlers. Like it doesn't matter what kind of attention they get. Like, you know, they may not even like yeah. actually have these values or whatever. They just want right. to get attention. And, but it's just. Well, and what I have found, especially in the advocacy life and in and working, you know, testifying in so many committees and commissions and legislatures and all, most opposition just wants to be heard. And mm -hmm. I think you need to apply that to almost any kind of conflict in your life. And remember that if you can just shut up and listen to someone, they'll almost always exhaust themselves by getting what they want, which was just to be heard. Because they almost never have enough actual commitment to what they believe in to follow it up with action. They just want to scream. So let them scream. Let them say their quote unquote peace, and then you get back to doing the right thing. But, you know, hurt people hurt people. And so if you let people scream and shout and get their hurt out in the ether, it will fade away. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, that, that is like a big message on, you know, the most excellent next page podcast is, the, which is our <laughs> new name. <laughs> But that, that that is where a lot of this, you know, it comes from is that the cycle continues because hurt people hurt people and those people then go on to hurt other people. And as long as we can have our own personal accountability and we can say it ends here and move forward on a positive note, then those people slowly get kind of, you know, hopefully they get help. But for the most part, they're not screaming and yelling at the expense of other people's actual livelihoods and their existence. So, you know, I think it's an important message. Right. Yeah. And particularly in this day and age where most angry interactions with strangers tend to happen on the interwebs, remember this person chose to go all in on a keyboard to scream into the void while you're out there just living your life and hopefully doing the good thing. Because that was particularly hard. A lot of friends and colleagues who have run for office, we also had a, a sort of text thread and conversation list with each other over the years about just being there for each other while we went through that process. Because you want to talk about personal attacks. I mean, people will they'll say you wear the wrong kind of shoelaces and that makes you a horrible, disqualifiable person. And so that's them that they're going to do that. You know, whoever is the occupant of your position, you know, whether it's your name on the ballot, the person, you know, who's in the chair in the office, whoever that person is, is going to be the recipient of that hate or that anger. So it's not you. They're not mad at you. They're mm -hmm. mad at probably the fact that they didn't have the guts to do what you're doing. So their only good use of energy is to scream into the void on a keyboard. Let them do it. Don't respond. Don't feed fire. Hurt people hurt people until they run out of people to hurt. And then they just go away. I love that. Yeah. I mean, everybody out there, just let them just start all arguing with themselves. You know, they're just all because, you know, if yeah, they're all just, just echoing away. each other, then they'll just, you know, at what point? What's the point at that point? <laughs> So yeah, I think that's a great message. And I think that you're just such an awesome person and have done such wonderful work and can't wait to see what else is to come. You know, there's obviously still a lot of work still to be done and that you have such a varied background, but you know, it can be applied in so many wonderful ways. So we just can't thank you enough for coming on this afternoon. It has been old well, this morning, I guess, a delight. But before we let you go. We have a tradition on the show to ask the question of the day. So our question for you is, would you rather have a rewind button or a pause button on your life? Ooh. It's a tough one. <laughs> we were debating this earlier. It's tough. It's very hard. I think it would have to be a pause because every brick in the road, even the ones that you tripped over and skinned your knee – were at least a brick that moved you forward. So when you get to the good spot, pause, savor, hold on to it, 
you know, and I would do that right now. I have everything I could wish for and dream of right now in this moment. I also know it's fleeting. So my job, for example, is at the whim of the president of the United States. And if he, God willing, wins the next term, I have, I could stay. And if not, then we have to figure out the next chapter. But what I'm doing right now is everything I could dream of with the most wonderful people I could dream of in the city that I love. So yes, I would hit pause, but I also know I am here because of every good and bad thing behind. So I don't know that I'd go back and change any of it. I love that. Love that, yes. Jonathan. Where did you two net out? I mean, I think- We were still debating it before the podcast. I know. I don't think you really even settled on. I mean, I think my first instinct is to say rewind just because, but like in the short term, like, oh, I just said something stupid. Let's rewind that and I will try again. <laughs> But I agree that the pause, yeah, I think more the all I can think about is just the things that the, the, my personal embarrassing missteps, but as a whole, like as a whole, I think the pause is the way to go because. Well, it's interesting that you said pause, that he said pause to savor like the sweet moments. I was thinking more hit, hit the pause button in the middle of an argument so I could calm down yeah. <laughs> or something, you yeah. know? Like, yeah. <laughs> pause. Breathe, breathe, breathe. You know what? It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I took some time. And it I doesn't took some matter. Time in my brain. <laughs> I think they're so they're both useful they were, tools. We're all, we're all, yeah, but they're but, all useful. <laughs> yeah. They can both be be useful, but I, I think the pause is, is great because Stupid. time is so fast. And we only have this life right now to experience. So I agree, especially with like when I'm with my kids. And, you know, have that rare moment of not getting a million emails and texts. Those are the times that I'm like, can we just live right here for a second? But yeah. I love that. Great answer. And well, thank you for letting me live in this wonderful, possible moment. This is really special. You both have something great here and you tell really important stories about hurt and hope and healing. And I, I'm just grateful that, that it's out there for people to know the A, they're not alone, and B, every type of journey is valid and beautiful and lean into it because it's just yours. That's what you oh, have is your journey. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And gonna... thank you for your service to this country. I mean, we really, it's honestly, it's great. It is. <laughs> Thanks, friends. Yes. Thanks right. for having me. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. So what'd you think? He's my buddy. I love him. He's just, I'm so in awe of him and the work that he has done, not only for LGBT people, but just the work he's done on, because I've known Jonathan a long time and the work he's done on himself as a human, he was always an amazing human, but the fact that he has taken the time, you know, when he got a little emotional and was talking about, you know, breathing through some of that the times where he had to see a therapist when he was really, he felt the weight of the world was on his shoulders when he was really, you know, came guns a blazing out there with the fighting for LGBT rights. And he just inspires me so much. And I haven't seen him like for over a decade into whatever Jonathan did. Jonathan went 150 to 200%. That's just always who he was. Even 20 years ago, that's who he was. And so it's great that he's been able to harness that in the world of politics so that that can be used because that's so useful in that field, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree. I think it's like, one, it's an amazing thing to see people that you kind of grew up with or, you know, before they were stars, but to see them succeed and be out there and be such a big part of positive change. Mm -hmm. And then it also helps you to, it inspires me to see people like that, that I'm like, okay, well, what, what am I doing? I need to get out there and do more too. <laughs> but it's, it's also just nice to know that there are people in our, you know, I'd say our corner out there fighting for us that are, you know, real and, but also like bulldogs, tenacious, yes. that they're not going to give up. That's a great that this word is, for him, tenacious. Because Jonathan's yeah, never been afraid it's, of a it's, fighter to roll his sleeves up and get in the mud and, you know, he can clear a room. 
I mean, or pack around, yeah. either way. Yeah, whatever you need to be done. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, and I just, the message of that we all need to come together. I mean, I feel like it sounds like a cliche, but at like the end of the day, it's such a simple and necessary thing to happen. And that we are not all just pieces of ourselves, that we are all a conglomeration of different things. We all have something to relate to with somebody else. And that, you know, if we're going to heal this country as a whole, you know, that we have to do it together. And if anything, you know, there's nothing like bringing two people together than having the same common enemy, you know? Exactly. So I think that, you know, if we can just get everybody that it's not all just the fight for just that, you know, one issue that that is in itself, it, there's always a domino effect. There's always a connection. And the major connection is that a lot of us are being disenfranchised, being put down and having our rights taken away for no good reason other than people are paranoid and scared. And he said it's about and control. That, yeah. And there's that's no way to live. You mm-hmm. know, that's no way to live and it's not fair. So I encourage everybody out there that feels that same way, you know, that that is a great, I think it's a great way for, at least for me to deal with my anxiety and my, you know, my anger at times Mm -hmm. with what's going on right now in a variety of ways is to feel like you're doing something. So, you know, if you feel out of control or feel like you're scared about the future, you know, you have a voice and by using that voice, it can be a way of being like, okay, at least I put in my part. Exactly. And it gives you an outlet. Yeah. You know, that, else was, so that you're not just stewing. Exactly. And you know, the other thing, when he was talking about the opposition and they just, and just, he's like, if you just let somebody talk and they just want to feel heard, I thought that was so profound to, if you just let somebody talk, they'll talk themselves, they'll talk it out and you don't have to say a word so they can feel heard. And I think you can apply that to, Many, <laughs> not just politics, but many things in life. If people just want to be heard. It doesn't matter. If, and if you disagree with them, you're probably not going to change their mind in that moment if they're so fired up. So just let them talk. Mm-hmm. Let them get it out. And then maybe come under it and say, you know, how do you feel? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they go back and they read that keyboard rant or they, right. <laughs> you know, think about what they said and they're like, well, that was a little bit um, maybe inappropriate. <laughs> it was a little I much. might want to change my message. Let's re <laughs> let's hit the rewind on that. But yeah, I think it, that that is a very important message that it, most people just want to be heard and understood. And you know, I think that a good amount of all of this hate or what is perceived as hate and discrimination is is really just people being afraid. It's fear, yeah. And yeah, and it comes from a wounded place and a lack of control. So, you know, as much as we don't really necessarily want all of that nonsense out in the world, just let it go and evaporate and just do better. Well, I love the way he protects himself as he knows that it has nothing to do with him. It is that their own trauma, their own things going on within their day. And it's very true. Like, Nine times out of 10, if someone's screaming at you or someone is in opposition of you or whatever, it typically has, it's all about their journey and their either lack of growth or ability to to, to grow because they're so self-isolating in their own, they'll just sit in their stew in their own unhappiness. Exactly. It's a reflection of their mental state. You know, it's just, you can tell a lot of it comes from, it's like the Karens, you know, they just don't have anything to do and they're bored exactly. and they don't like anything to change. So, but unfortunately there is a lot of change that needs to happen and they can deal with it. Exactly. Um, but thank you so much, Jonathan, yeah. for coming on. We had a great time talking. He was so patient with um, our, us. Our technical difficulties. Oh my God. Our technical difficulties because we are, you know, to be in the same place. We This is always <laughs> you know? a learning experience. But yes, thank you so much for coming on, Jonathan. We'd love to have you back and definitely get to hit him up in DC and see if I can get a, get a tour. You know, maybe some, <laughs> some perks. <laughs> All right, Jonathan. Well, we adore you on this program and we hope you have a wonderful day. And everybody listening to this, spread the word. Spread the word. Get the message out. And just the message of love. You know, let's just send that out. 
Speaking of love, love you. Love you too. Later. Bye.